I'm about to read the, the praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We're turning to Matthew chapter 25 and verse number one. We're going to read a very familiar story, but before I get into too much of that, I just want to, I want to recount something, um, and it's really just what happened a week ago, and, and most of us here were, were witnesses to this, but last week we had uh, brother and sister uh, Tim and Brenda Hudnall with us in, from Florida, and, and both of them are very sensitive to the voice of God and to the leading of God. And um, I will tell you that when they, I tried to get them to stay another week. I, I, I said, you know, I don't feel like God wants you in Florida. I feel like your call uh, is in Iowa. You should just stay. Matter of fact, just move here is kind of where I went with them. Uh, but you know what? I feel like, Tim and Brenda, if you're watching, you're probably out of the will of God being in Florida right now. I'm just going to throw that out there. But anyway, what an amazing day last Sunday. I, I, I just rejoice over the fact Kareem and her daughter were here and they testified of the power and glory of God. I, I was so excited that when we got done, Larita approached me and she said, I just feel like I have to speak the 23rd Psalm. Well, let me tell you something. When you begin parroting the word of God, when you begin taking it out of your heart, that's a prophetic word. Okay. The Bible's prophetic. I mean, it, it is prophecy from one end to the other. And, and so there was prophecy that started. And so here's what excited me. I didn't do it. I mean, this was something God was just moving on people's hearts. And then it was testimony after testimony. Richard testified about how God healed his mind. Uh, Ron testified about how the power of God was all over him. And he felt that. And he said to me today, I feel better today. And then, it, you know, Shelly got up and, and testified about uh, the peace of God that had come on her. And I'm not going to go into all the details of that. But I, I just know this. She's a changed young lady. I mean, the glory of God touched her. And then uh, Carly, who got a touch in her in her mind and and released uh released from depression but then she also has a paralyzed stomach and she can't eat any solid food and she texted my wife that afternoon she said i'm eating solid food today and so what an incredible day in the presence of god and i have been um, th this entire week, it, it hasn't ended for me. It's just been moving from one thing in God to the next thing in God, the voice of God, and I have just been the recipient of, of the glory of God uh, day after day after day, moment after moment. And, and so I just want to tell you, I'm very thankful for all that God has allowed me uh, to be part of, and I'm thankful that I got the, uh, that we got to share this together what God is doing, uh, not just in this place, but I, I believe what God is doing is explosive to go way beyond what's happening here. So praise God. Praise the Lord for all that. Um, I'll tell you what, if you're at Matthew chapter 25, I'm just going to have you stand with me if you're able just to honor the word of the Lord. Um, the Bible says this, and this is Jesus speaking here. It says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, so they had their lamp, and they took no oil with them. But, they that, but the wise, they took oil in their vessels along with their lamps. Verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us your oil for our lamps. Give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, I know you not. And then verse 13, it says, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. 
Um, just let me read part of this again, starting at verse 6. And it says, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out and meet him. And all the virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamp. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. And I just want to preach to you about give us of your oil. Give us of your oil. So let's take our Bibles right now and set them down. And then one more time, I'm going to ask you to lift your voice. I let your voice out and worship him. And then I'm going to ask you to lift your hands unto him. Lord Jesus, I worship you. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, almighty God. I worship you, almighty God. I worship you, great I am. I worship you, King of kings. I worship the one true living God today. I worship you, Jesus. Now, could we just put our hands together for the Lord one more time? Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You can be seated today. Um. So, two weeks ago, I, I was in Ladysmith preaching, and we had gone up on the Friday before that. And when I went up to Ladysmith, or the Rice Lake area where we were at, I really felt like I went in the flow of God's Spirit. Matter of fact, I have been living in, in a flow for a time now where God has been doing things, and I have felt the voice of God. I... I I mentioned last week to this church, something happened. There was something transformative that took place in the church house. I felt an elevation of level. I felt an elevation of the place we were standing with God. And I will tell you, I feel that at a personal level as well, that I just, the voice of God seems to come far more often. And it just seems to come louder than it was. And I was talking with a friend of mine. I said, you know, it used to be that, you know, you'd pray and you'd pray and you'd pray and you felt like you got a word from God here and there. But, but something's different. Something's just flowing. And it's like, you know, I'm living in that flow. And I will tell you, I went to, to Ladysmith. And matter of fact, I mean, I, I believe everybody's heard me say this, but, you know, I love Ladysmith. I, I really enjoyed that a lot. But uh, I, I knew the Lord had brought me here and called me here, and, and I, 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 I knew that my, my calling is here. But I would still, when people would ask me, where are you from? And I would say Ladysmith, Wisconsin. And, and I will tell you that there was something transformative last week because I, I will tell you that as I drove through the town, I'm like, this is not my city. I do not belong here. I just want to be back in Iowa. I just want to be in that place where the flow of the Holy Ghost is moving in my life, and I want to feel that. I want to know that. And I will tell you, I had an incredible uh, moment with God uh, on Saturday prior to the Sunday morning service, and I'll share that with you here in just a moment. But I, I will tell you, there is something that is flowing, and there is something that is moving. Moving. And, and I will tell you uh, that we have got to be hungry. There's got to be a passion in our hearts that says, I want what God is pouring out. Okay, I want to be touched by the Holy Ghost. I want to be moved by God's Spirit. I, I will tell you uh, that I believe, I believe there's coming a time when the hungry will not sit with the religious. The religious are the ones, oh, bless God, I made it to church today, Lord, count me up for one. And, and we go to church, and I will tell you, sometimes you, you don't have more than your duty. There's times, listen, I'm going to just bear my soul here. As a pastor, there's days I thought, I don't want to go to church today, okay? I'm just putting it out there, like it's happened, all right? But I know this, that, that my desire is to get into the presence of God. I do not want to come to church today just to fulfill um, fulfill some duty or fulfill something that says well you got to go to church on Sunday I want to move in that flow of the Holy Ghost I want it to be poured out matter of fact what we saw and what we experienced last week I believe is the tip of the iceberg I believe that there are greater things than that that God is yet to pour out not just in this place but in this community in this last week you know God has a allowed me uh, to meet with people, sent people across my path, and, and mighty things have happened in a week's time. I, I'll tell you this, um, so um, Tuesday, Wednesday, I was down in Moline, 
And I got a call from Richard. And Richard, I have taught his, his wife Bible study. Uh, Richard is witness to his wife. And, and there are things that, that she has been very resistant to. And Richard called me. He said, Pastor, she wants to get the Holy Ghost. And she wants to be baptized in Jesus' name. Can you please come and pray? I said, Richard, we'll be there tonight. I was in Moline. I'm driving home. I'm going to go home and I'm going to meet with this woman and we're going to pray and see what God will do. We walked into that place. She said, I've got to get right with God. She said, I have got to get the Holy Ghost. I have got to get baptized in Jesus' name. Lord willing, we're going to baptize her this week. But uh, we sat down. She sat there and and she's not very mobile. I said said to her, I said, just lean your head back and we're going to pray. And in just a second, we'll see what God does. Nobody laid a hand on her. Nobody touched her. But she began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. I'm telling you something. God is moving and revival is on the land. And revival's taking place wherever the Spirit of God is moving. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So here we are to, our, to what we had read today in the Bible. And the Bible tells us Jesus is speaking and he's trying to tell us, uh, he's given us a metaphor of the church. Okay, he's given us a metaphor of going to heaven, what, what it's going to be like, what it's going to take to get there. And he tells us a story of, uh, of a bridegroom and a bride and ten virgins that are, are bridesmaids. And he says that five were wise and five were not so smart. And, and the Bible says that, that the five wise that they had a vessel that they had full of oil and they had their lamp that was full of oil. Okay, and it appears that the lamps were burning. Okay, because it got to the point where they had burned out. And, and, and so the five foolish, they only had a lamp with oil in it. They didn't have an additional vessel with oil in it. And, and it says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered. And the Bible doesn't get after them for being asleep. It doesn't get after them so, well, you know, you ain't so smart because you're asleep. Well, what I understand of Galilean weddings is this, and I'm, uh, this is how I've learned uh, a Galilean wedding has ta- would take place, that <clears throat> a father would bring his son into the center of, of, the, uh, of the city. And when the woman came that he wanted to marry with her family, that the father of the groom would read a contract out, uh, a, a marriage contract. You know, my son's going to love you, and he's going to take care of you, and, and, and you know, you're going to be blessed. And, and he would read this contract, but he would read it in a public place for everybody to hear. Uh, uh, Jordan Jaylene, if you would leave your marriages to experienced parents, I'm just saying it would be a lot better, right? I mean, most of us parents feel that way anyway. Just experienced parents and so here an experienced dad two experienced dads and perhaps two experienced moms they would enter into a contract an agreement okay so he would read this aloud and it was in public for everybody to hear and then money would change hands and it wasn't to purchase the bride that's not what that was about the money that changed hands went from the groom's family to the bride's family and what that was was a guarantee uh, not that the guy would show up for the wedding, but that if anything happened to him, that the bride would be taken care of. I, I will tell you this, Jesus is always looking to take care of the bride. He's always looking out for her well-being, and he's always trying to bring us to a place where, our, where, where heaven's looking after us and where he connects with us, and he makes sure that we're taken care of. And so that money would change hands, and then a, a cup of wine would be poured. And that cup of wine would be, uh, the bridegroom would give it to the bride. And the bride would receive that cup. And that bride had two choices. In Galilean weddings, it was the bride's decision whether she would marry the bridegroom or not. Many, uh, I've been in India, and, you know, you can go and purchase a wife. You know, it's not as easy as showing up at a wife store and saying, I'll take that one. But, you know, it's a 
contractual agreement from parents to parents, and the, and the children honor that contractual agreement. And matter of fact, I've had people say, well, our system's much better than yours. Our divorce rate's really low. Uh, you know, whatever. I, I don't know. I'm not arguing the merits of the system. I'm just telling you how it works in some cultures. But in the Galilean wedding, it didn't work like that. In the Galilean wedding, what would happen is that bride would receive that cup of wine, and she could pour it out and give it back to the bridegroom, and she said, no, I don't want to marry this guy. Or she could drink of that cup, and then she could hand it back to the bridegroom, at which point the bridegroom would pour the wine out, and he would say these words, I'm not going to drink of this cup again until I come into my father's house or until I drink it again anew in my father's house, which is something very similar. We recognize those same words of Jesus Christ at the Last Supper when they had the, when they had the, the wine. Um, and, and so he would, uh, the bridegroom would receive that. Now, if the bridegroom received the cup, him and his father would go home. And the bridegroom had his, bride, his uh, bridal party, the, the men that would stand up with him, he would go and he would build onto the house of his father, okay? And he would not receive his bride until the house was built for the bride to come. But not only that, the bridegroom didn't get to decide the timing of the wedding. Only the father would know the timing of the wedding. Only the father would be the one to say, now is time for you to go get your bride. And so it would be sometime after the house had been finished. It would be sometime after... All the preparations had been made. But during this time, the bridal party on both sides, the men's side and the ladies' side, they had to constantly be ready for the bridegroom would come in an hour that nobody knew. He would come to declare, I'm taking my bride away with me. And so the bridegroom, he would lay there and, and wait until sometime when his father would say, now is the time. I have come to, I have come to get what belongs to me. And, and it was when the father said, you go get the bride. It's time for you to go get it. That they would go out into the streets and they would shout and there would be a loud procession that said, declared, the bridegroom is on his way. He's coming. And it was at that time that the bride and the bridesmaids had to be ready to go. But the Bible tells us this, that it was in that hour that the, brides, that the bridegroom called and, and that the noise went out, that, that the bridesmaids got up and there were five foolish and five wise and it appears that they all had oil in their lamps because the bible says they trimmed their lamps and f and five of them had gone out or actually all ten had gone out but they had oil for five of the wise and they put it into their lamps and they had they had oil for the party so then what would happen next is the bridegroom would come and he would bring a, a chair or they would bring a chair and they would put the bride upon the chair and it had handles on it and they would carry her away to the wedding. And they called it flying the bride. They, they called it the bride was literally flying to her place of the wedding and the bridal party would follow. And once they got to the place of the wedding, everybody that was ready could come in. But anybody that wasn't ready and wasn't there at that moment in time, the doors would shut and they wouldn't be opened. And the Bible says this, that Jesus said when this happens, he said the doors are going to shut and the foolish are going to say, let me in. And the Lord's going to reply, I never knew you. It's all a metaphor of about what is about to happen in the world. I, I will tell you this, that I have been so taken by this, that one of the things that happened to me is that I had a man of God speak to me about this, uh, these verses of scripture. And, and he began to talk to me about how there were five that, that were wise and there were five that were less wise. But he began to expound some things to me that I had never heard before about this. And I thought, this is the voice of God that is coming. And, and it's simply this, that those five wives, they had enough oil for themselves. But had they been plugged into the source, had they been a conduit rather than a vessel, had they allowed the things of God to flow through them and be a pipe rather than just be a container, then they could have given what those five 
foolish needed to enter into the wedding. I, I'm going to tell you something. We have got to pray and we have got to pursue and we've got to get hungry for God because God is looking for that conduit that that oil can flow through. Anytime you read about the oil in Scripture, it's talking about the Holy Ghost. It's talking about the Spirit of the living God. And I will tell you something. It appears that there are those that function with a shortage of the Holy Ghost in their life, but I will tell you there is something that can happen to us that we can be plugged into that source and that Spirit of God can flow through us and it can move in ways that we never dreamed, we've never thought of before and we can be there to fill the hungry. We can be there to put oil on dry ground. We can be there to allow that flow of God's Spirit to work in somebody else's life. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise God. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. This week was so amazing to me. It was really amazing. I had a friend of mine call, and I started telling him all the stuff that goes. I said, brother, it's disaster at every turn. But I will tell you, God's moving in the midst of it, and every bit of that disaster is just distraction. And I began to tell him some things. I, I, I think I told him about a woman by the name of Sheila Long. Sheila, I hope you're watching. Uh, matter, uh, she was driving down the road by her house. And, and I'm like, if you're at this road, you either know where you are or you're completely lost because you don't get here by accident. And so I, I start to drive around her because she had pulled over. She jumps out and said, could you help me? I'm looking for this place. I said, absolutely. I said, you're very close, but it's not here. And so I, I told her to follow me in her car. And, and so she follows me. And I, I've got my wife and I've got the Hudnalls with me. And, and so I drive to where that camp is. And, and it's not off the road. Like, it's off-road. It's not off the road. It's way off-road. And, and so I drive her part way back. And she sees other cars parked there. And, and so I see her park. And she said, I'm fine now. She said, I can get there from here. I said, I know this. You think you know where you are. And you think you're in a good place. But you're not. You're not where you think you are. And I'm telling you right now, you need to get into my truck because I've got to take you where you've got to go. I I'm going to tell you something. There are those in this world, they think they know where they're at. And they think they've felt the presence of God. And they say, well, bless God. You know, when I was three years old, I heard the voice of God. A and I'll tell you something. There's no flow. There's a stagnancy in that. We can't have one encounter or two encounters with God. It's got to be something that literally flows in our life. That it flows from day to day today. I, I will tell you any more. I'm more, I'm more amazed when I don't hear the voice of God than when I do. I will tell you, it wasn't always that way. Sometimes I would say, this is amazing. I finally heard the voice of God. And any more, it's like, I hear the voice of God. I feel the flow of God's spirit. And I begin to start, I start to speak what God gives me. And so I put her in the truck. I said, I know this is crazy. And I know this is scary that you're getting in a vehicle with people you don't know. But if you don't get in the vehicle, you're not going to get where you're going and I'm going to tell you something that God is opening up experiences to people and God is pouring out his spirit why because it's a promise he said in the last days, says the Lord I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh and all these major miracles are going to happen I'll tell you this it's a promise it's a promise we can expect the outpouring of God's spirit and if we would get tapped into that source there would be enough oil to fill the earth praise God Come on, clap your hands to the Lord. I put Sheila in. She got in. She agreed to get in, and I drove her. She would have had to walk probably a half mile through a pasture and uphills and downhills. And, and I said, I'm telling you. And when we finally got where she could see it, she's like, I never would have got here without you. I never would have. I'm going to tell you, it's the same thing with the Lord. We cannot get there without Him. One experience isn't enough. Two experiences isn't enough. And I'm going to say this, going to church week after week after week ain't enough. We've got to have that flow of God's Spirit. We've got to be a conduit for Him to flow through and to minister through. And the power of God that's manifest in this earth is going to come through His children. Praise God. Richard calls me up on Wednesday. And he says... Uh, oh, let me just back up and tell you this. Sheila Long, she says, I'm going to come to your church. Well, we pull up to the, this, uh, this camp, and there's a lady by the name of Denise Smith there. And uh, Denise is a, a neighbor of ours, and, and we've taught her Bible studies, and she's never come to church. But she says, 
to all of these ladies that are out there in the back 40. She said, you got to go to that church. I thought, well, praise God. God's pouring oil on dry places. And then we ran into Sheila, I think it was last Monday or Tuesday, and she said, I'm coming to church by you. I mean, I believe she'll be here. I, I'm just, I say that in faith. I do. Because there was a connection that was made. There was oil that began to flow in her, her life. And, and then, so that was Tuesday. Wednesday, uh, the Hudnalls left. And, and again, Tim, if you're watching, I believe against the will of God. Come back. Be back for next Sunday. Uh, praise God. But uh, so Wednesday, I drive down to Moline. Richard calls me. We go over and we pray for Diane. Diane uh, gets the Holy Ghost on Wednesday night, and we're making plans to uh, baptize her. Actually, we were going to do it Saturday, and then Richard ended up in the hospital. And, and all of that's so cool that Richard ended up in the hospital. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to take care of Richard. <laughs> Because the whole time I was in there with him, he's telling everybody, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I'll tell you what, if I was a sinner, I'd get right or Richard would be dead. One or the other, it wouldn't be anything in the middle. But I'll tell you, Richard is hungry and passionate for a move of God. So we pray for Diane. And, and so I, I had driven through Eldora, and there were, there's three churches there that lost their pastor. The Methodist Church, the Congregational Church, the Baptist Church. They've all lost their pastors. They don't have a pastor there. And I was driving past the Baptist Church in Eldora, and I saw I had a 7 o'clock prayer meeting. I don't know why. I just told my wife, I said, I'm going. I'm going to that 7 o'clock prayer meeting. I have no idea why I'm going. So I show up at, at the 7 o'clock prayer meeting. I made the mistake of telling Richard where I was going. He said, I'm going to, Pastor. And I thought, oh, Lord, have mercy, because I don't know what's about to happen now. So anyway, we show up at, at the, the Baptist prayer meeting. I would hesitate to call it a prayer meeting. It wasn't anything that I thought was a prayer meeting. Um, but I will tell you what it did remind me of. It reminded me of the Oklahoma Dust Bowl. I, it was so dead and dry in there in the spirit realm. that There was no sense of life in the spirit. And, and I thought I was ready to start spitting cotton balls at any moment in time. And I just started praying. I said, Lord, you've got to reveal your glory. You have got to reveal something to these people. You've got to allow that oil to be poured out in their life. And I'm praying. And I'm just sitting there. And I'm like, Lord, give me, ask me to testify. Do whatever. But, but Lord, allow that oil to flow. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I'm sitting there and I'm waiting. And all of a sudden it ends out of the blue. I'm like, what just happened? And I'm like, Lord, did I miss it? Did I miss it? And the Lord opened a door. It was so interesting. I didn't try to hide who I was. I said, I pastor a church. I, they said, we're going to have a time of fellowship. We're going to have cake and coffee. And if, if anybody likes good cake, I mean, that's a great place to go. I didn't eat anybody. It looked delicious, I'm going to tell you that. Um, so we sat down, and I got to start testifying about the power of God to a lady that was there. I started testifying to a lady and her husband and then another man. And suddenly it was just, we were just telling the story of God. But let me tell you, in the middle of all of this, the oil's flowing. It's just flowing. It's flowing. A guy comes up to me, and the spirit of debate was upon him. He said, do you believe in this? I said, well, I believe that, but this is the way I believe it. And then he started his next sentence off with, don't you believe, and I always know when somebody says that, what they really mean is, here's what I think, and you should think this too. And he said, do you believe in one saved, always saved? I said, no, I don't believe in that at all. Uh, he said, well, we believe that here. I said, well, praise God. You know, I don't know what to tell you. He said, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. There's nothing you can do to, to get away from the, the, present, or the, the salvation of God. I said, well... If that's true, God needs to dig up Ananias and Sapphira and apologize to them because he killed them because they were, living, they were in sin. And he said, well, God could have killed them and he could have, they still could have gone to heaven. I'm like, seems pretty far-fetched to me, but okay, let's say that's not right. I said, well, what about Laodicea? He's like, well, what do you mean about that? I said, God told them he's going to take their place away from the, out of the kingdom of heaven, and they weren't going to be allowed into heaven if they didn't get right. And, and so all of this stuff is flowing. It's distraction because we're just witnessing about the power of God and all these things. And so I hear my wife. She's still talking. I'm like, okay, I'll deal with this character. And I just said, sir, I know what you believe, and you know what I believe, and I'm going to put a period on it, and I'm going to end it right here because I'm not going down in this debate. I'm not getting involved in this. I want the oil to flow. I want the oil to flow into 
people's lives. I want people to be touched by the Holy Ghost. I want them to understand that there is a God in heaven that is pouring out His Spirit. And and I will tell you something, that oil just flowed in that place. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what God's going to do with that. Likely there's still going to be a Baptist church there next week, and perhaps they'll find a pastor. But what I am telling you is that they've got to be touched by the oil, and if we don't have it, they can't be touched. It's up to the children of God. We can't just be vessels, but we have to be a pipe. We've got to be a conduit. We've got to have something that has a constant and continuous flow in our lives. Can you say praise the Lord? Tell you what, as a matter of fact, just clap your hands to the Lord. You may not think this is very good. And you, I mean, I just hang on. We'll get you through it real quick. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean that. Um, so I started to tell you, just wait a second, Benji. Well, I'll tell you what, bring those in. Give them, your, give them to, come on. Okay, all right, I won't say nothing. So pretend you didn't hear me say that. Um, anyway, so I started to tell you two weeks ago, I was up in Ladysmith. We were staying in, in the city of Rice Lake. And um, Saturday morning before church, um, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find a place to pray. And um, go ahead. Prepare to be amazed. Why don't you give him a hug, too? Give your daddy a hug. Tell him he's your favorite daddy. Give your grandpa a hug. Oh, that's so cool. Well, let's give our dads one more hand here. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Just, I don't see any handprints on you guys, so I'm, I'm amazed. So let me try to wrap this up here. So two weeks ago on that Saturday, my wife and I got in Friday night, and then Saturday morning I got up to go to prayer. And my wife, many times she'll ask me this. She'll say, do you want to pray here with me? And I, always, I pretty much always have the same answer. My answer is always pretty much no, I want to go be by myself. Um, I, I, just, I just want to be with me and God. That, that's just kind of my pattern on how I do it. And it's, I, there's times I do pray, my wife and I will pray together, but there's also many times that we're just separated. And matter of fact, we'll be on the phone together. We'll be talking to each other on the phone, praying at the same time, but we won't be in the same building. Uh, I mean, that's just how it goes. So anyway, 7 o'clock rolls up uh, at, uh, on Saturday morning. We have a ministerial, it's not even a ministerial prayer call, that's not right, but we have a bunch of pastors, missionaries, evangelists that get together and we just pray. And that's all we do. And a lot of times, in the beginning of it, so like when the phone call or the Zoom meeting just starts, there's a lot of talking going on, you know, back and forth, sometimes some bantering. And God starts to deal with me on some stuff, and I can't listen to the call, and I shut the call off. And God shows me four distinct things. I mean, they were very distinct. I'm sitting in a church parking lot. It's an old-time church. It was built, sure, over 100 years ago, and they put an addition on it, so they're still using it. It's still a very functional church. And behind the church is a cemetery. And I shut this call off, and I'm looking at the cemetery, and suddenly I see one of the graves explode. This is in the spirit. I didn't see an exp- Nobody shelled the graveyard. And this grave explodes like with the force of a cannon going off underneath it, but it was stronger than a cannon. Cannons always shoot in arcs like this. This thing just took off straight up like a rocket. And God, many times when he shows me things, he gives me revelation at the same time. I knew what I was seeing. I was watching the rapture of the church. And I was focused on the fact that I saw one grave. I said, Lord, so few. Well, then he immediately picked me up, and he took me into the city 
um, and he showed me there, there's churches in the city, and I'm just going to call them charismatic churches, you know, feel good, easy, believism, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, but they don't operate in the truth of God's word, and they don't operate in, in spirit at all. And the Lord showed me like a multitude of people. And this multitude of people, he said to me, they're all looking for my coming. They all believe in my return. They all believe that I'm going to take them away, but they're living in deception. They're deceived, and they're not going. They're not going to make it. And I was sitting there kind of dumbfounded while God's explaining this to me. And then immediately my vision shifts. And this is, this is probably the most important part of this to me anyway. Or I mean, it's all important. But then he starts to show me the apostolic world, which is what we're a part of. Apostolic uh, Pentecostal, meaning we believe in the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the miracles of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Jesus never started a church. The apostles started the church. That Jesus said, greater things than these are you going to do, speaking to the apostles. And then what we would learn in the Bible in Hebrews says that Jesus is the chief apostle, and then he taught the apostles. And so we talk about an apostolic or, or an apostle's uh, church, and we, we always look back. Where, where do you find the apostles' church? Well, the book of Acts is all about the apostles. It's all about the churches they started, the, the ministries they did, and then um, and then you can read Romans through Jude. That's uh, those are the writings of, of the apostles, most mostly Paul, Peter, John. We read about that, and those are letters to individuals in the churches or to the churches themselves. And, and so we get this record of this apostolic ministry, which makes up most of the New Testament. And uh, then, of course, we have the book of Revelation, and that's from the Apostle John. And the Lord shows me the apostolic church. But this is what I saw. I saw the apostolic church sleeping in bed, slumbering. The ten virgins, they all slept, and there was nothing wrong with sleeping. But when you are asleep to spiritual things, and spiritual things cannot awaken you, then it's a sleep that will sleep us past the promise taking away, catching away of the church. And the Lord showed this to me, and I was sitting there with my mouth hanging open, you know, like, and, uh, and there was a fourth part. To, there was a uh, share that with you later because it was kind of on a different note. But he, he shows me this, and my mouth is just hanging open. And I, I get back on the prayer call, and it's, I think, I don't know, it was pretty fast after I got on. Uh, Brother Hudnall, who you've all met, directs that prayer call in the morning. And he said, I feel like Brother Albertson has something for us. I said, I'm not telling you what to pray or how to pray, but I'm going to tell you what God just showed me. And I'll tell you, that place just exploded in prayer. So the next day, I'm preaching in Ladysmith. And I told him very plainly about the vision. I told him very plainly what's going on with the apostolic church. And I said these words to them. There's coming a day when the hungry will not sit with the religious. The hungry, the ones that have that oil that is flowing through them, it's a constant flow. It doesn't stop. It, you have to understand, we're not going to run out of oil if we're connected to the source. If we're connected to the source, it is a free flow. It is always going to be replenished, and we are going to flow in the Spirit of God. I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am about what took place last week. Shelly, that was nothing less than prophecy when you got up and declared what God had done for you. Uh, uh, Ron, that was nothing less than prophecy when you got up and declared what God had done for you. Lorita, that was nothing less than prophecy when you got up and you began to speak the words of God. Let me tell you something. All of that is the flow of the oil. It's all the flow. It's all the flow. It's all the flow. And I will tell you something. that God wants to flow through His church. God wants to flow through you. He wants to minister through you. We have got to allow that free flow of God's oil. Praise God. Why don't you stand with me this morning? Amen. 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 I was on my way here this morning, and I was just talking to the Lord. And I was, I was doing much of what I did when I came here. I was just saying, Lord, I'm so thankful for you.
I heard a man say the other day, thank God for Jesus. It's like, thank God for himself, right? Uh, and I'm like, yeah, thank God for Jesus. And then I started saying, happy, happy Father's Day, Lord. You're my father. And I said, Lord, what can I feed the church? What can I give to the church? And this is what I felt like he, showed, he told me. He said, raise them up to be disciple makers. Raise them up to be soul winners. I said, Lord, I don't know how to do that. I don't even know how to do that. And I believe that what you're hearing right now is deep calling unto deep. I believe that what you're hearing and feeling at this moment is the Lord saying, I want that oil to flow through you. I'm just going to ask you to step forward because I believe God's already put it in your hearts and your minds what you want to talk to him about and how you want to respond to what he's spoken to you. Let that oil flow through your life. Just let it flow today. Don't tell him you want to be a vessel, but tell him you want to be a conduit. Lord, I, I don't want, Lord... Oh, God, to be stuck without oil. I don't want to be in dry places. I want the flow of your spirit. Lord Jesus, flow. Lord Jesus, flow. Lord Jesus, flow.